All right, good morning. I'm Pamela Wallen, and today we're going to take a look at things economic, as we always do. Government Analytics launched this event, The Monthly, intent on giving voice to all of the numbers, and there are so many data sets out there that it's actually pretty overwhelming these days. Over the last several months, they have asked some of the brightest, most experienced economic minds in Canada to help us make sense of the numbers. David Dodge and Jack Mintz explain the debt levels, lack of investment, unconstrained spending, all creates high risk for future generations if we don't find ways to ensure, ensure growth and productivity. Then Kevin Page explored the cost of indifference, looked at lessons learned, lessons not learned, and the need to get the balance right between lives and livelihoods. Today, here on The Monthly, we look at the now. Where are we as we contemplate a post-COVID economy? And our thanks to Greg McDougall and Steve Saunders, who are government analytics and who have created this forum. So thank you both. On Monday, we will have a long overdue fiscal update, still no budget. There will be talk, of course, I'm sure, about a green economy and basic income supports, and the debate will continue over the need for a fiscal anchor and the government's apparent uh, embrace of modern monetary theory. But it's the data, particularly on demographics, says Don Drummond, that will determine our priorities as we plan the economic rebuild. And that data says, and it's a bit of a paradox, that everyone wants better long-term health care or uh, aged care, yet no individual nor any level of government can really afford it. This data is spelled out in a new report entitled Aging Well. It says that a senior tsunami is about to hit and we have no idea how to pay the bill. The number of seniors increased by more than 4 million over the past four decades. Of course, we're all living longer. Over the next 20 years, Canada must accommodate the needs of another 4 million plus. And here's the thing, 82% will be over 75 years of age. It's complex, the cost will rise, not to mention the demands of aging boomers. We will need more beds. And even if we just make a basic fix, that will increase costs by about 70%. So let me formally welcome Don Drummond, co-author of this report for Queen's, former ADM at Finance, where he served for some 23 years and went on to become the chief economist at TD for a decade. Just indulge me for a moment. Prime Minister Paul Martin called him one of the most principled and imaginative public servants, and we are very glad that he is using those talents now at Queen's at the School of Public Policy Studies and here this morning on the monthly. So uh, Dawn, welcome. And can we start with this rather, I think, explosive report? What is the stat? What is the number that scared you most? You know, I, I think we're getting it that we're gonna have more seniors. Um, you find the person on the street, so to speak, is kind of familiar that we've, about one sixth of our population is 65 plus and we're gonna go to a quarter. But that's not the thing. Not that much ha happens in the care world, in the health cost world, in the early ages of the seniors, 65 to 75, the ne greater needs have later. And it's that skewing, the increase in the average age of the seniors is gonna be the big thing. It's just pure math. I mean, you and I are examples of it. We're, we're quintessential baby boomers. Um, Right. When we get to that 75 plus, and particularly that 80 to 85, and there's a whole bunch of us, that's when things are going to get really rough. And it's, it's a paradox because it is the most predictable thing in the world. The, the birth rates and the death rates and the immigrants and that, they don't change very much. We can really pinpoint that. We should have seen this coming for a long time, and nobody's doing anything about it. And I'm very concerned with the, all the long-term care reviews that are underway right now, because they're gonna do the natural thing. They're gonna focus on the immediate problem and who can blame them. We have 80% of the COVID-related deaths have occurred in long-term care. Obviously, they have to focus on improving the infrastructure, improving the safety protocols. We have way fewer workers in long-term care per resident than anywhere else in the world. We have to deal with that. More workers, better qualified, better paid workers. But that's not going to look at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is we're going to be swamped 
if we continue under the status quo, we'll be swamped with the demand for long-term care beds. And you look at a province like Ontario, they've had a plan to build 15,000 more beds. That's rounding error. And in fact, they have probably they will probably decommission more long-term care beds. I mean, infamously, the Bob Cajun long-term care for people in the room with sheep. They, those probably won't exist anymore. We're probably going to take more out of service than we're going to add. So where are you and I going to end up when, when, when we get to this older thing? We're not going to build that. And nobody's doing very much about the alternatives, which would be home care supports and various different community looking. And again, how is it possible when something is so easily predicted that there's so little planning around it? We spend a very small portion of GDP on both long-term care and home care. Uh, as you say, relatively speaking, and you and I and boomers and we would don't want our parents or anybody we know or love in a room with six people with dirty curtains so that if something happens, we all die. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Is home care the answer and how do we shift the spending if that is it? Keep people in their own homes, send people in. Well, you're absolutely right. Relative to other developed countries, we spend less, 1.3% of our gross domestic product on long-term care. It's 1.8% on the average of the OECD countries. We're very low on the spectrum of home care. But even worse, when you combine those two, we spend $6 on long-term care for every dollar on home care. Whereas the Northern European countries spend about equally and Denmark, which has the highest satisfaction ratings on life satisfaction for the senior spends more on home care. And you, you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure out other countries are doing this better and we're way behind. So for many people, home care is the answer, not for everybody, but a lot of people need support. So for example, in Denmark, if you're having trouble getting out of your bathtub, you can call a community service and they'll bolt a bar beside your bathtub. You can get pre prepared meals. You can't, we got snow out here right now. You can have somebody show your right. driveway. You can do and provide a lot of those services, you know, 40 to $50 per day. Typically long-term care is 200. We have at any given moment, 13% of Canadians are in hospital that are not supposed to be in the hospital and they actually end up in hospital longer. Those are disproportionately seniors. That could be $1,000 a day and they're not receiving the services. That's the worst place. So, we, so we've got it all mixed up, but there needs to be a spectrum of housing opportunities that if you cannot live independently, even with some supports, there's various different community associations. There's private ones. There's an Oasis facility in Kingston, United Kingdom. There are communities that are stratified according to age groups. There's young people living with older people. There's concierge medical services provided in a center. There's a whole bunch of different ranges that could be explored. We could have a much more common phenomenon of the so-called, I don't know why we pick granny suites, but um, on the houses, something in the backyard. Often we don't even accommodate those in the, in the zoning bylaws. We could have a tax deduction for people that would do that um, to bring. There's, there's just many things that, that we could provide and it all comes back to the same thing. Why don't we give people what we want? Overwhelmingly, people want to age in place. And that means right. home as long as they can, but not in social and physical isolation, but in their community. They don't want to go off to somewhere where they're complete strangers and they don't go on anybody else. So why do we do that? And especially, it's even a more expensive option that nobody wants. It all seems really, really uh, off the mark. But who's going to pay that bill, Don? Are you saying that uh, seniors themselves are going to be responsible uh, for paying a, f a good chunk of that? Is the government and both federal and provincial going to have to start to build and create facilities? And I think more importantly, uh, train people and pay the bill for that. Right now, if it wasn't for uh, Filipino women immigrating to this country and looking after our seniors, we'd be in big trouble. So here, here's my guess. At the end of uh, the submission of all these long-term care reviews, will increase that 1.3% of GDP in long-term care about one third from improved infrastructure and about another one third from more workers and better trained and better compensated workers. Then that'll take us from 1.3 up to 2.2. 
But then we have about 250,000 long-term care beds in Canada at the moment. If we send the same percentage of people at each individual age to long-term care, by 2040, that 2.1 will jump up to 4.2. So we'll go from 1.3% of GDP to 4.2. And the bottom line is, before I talk about who pay for it, Canadians will pay for it. Um, there is unfortunately a belief that if the government pays for it, then nobody pays for it. The governments don't exist. <laughs> they, they, no, no, it's all the same taxpayers. Well, they, they take the money out of our pocket and it passes to them with a big administrative chunk uh, added and it gets paid out. So there, there is no magic tree. Uh, as Tip Macklin was, was saying, the Bank of Canada is not funding government spending. Uh, they're just holding some of the debt temporarily. There's, there's no creating this money. Somebody will pay for it. We can talk about the incidents. If it was paid as a user fee for long-term care, then the seniors themselves or family members and others connected to them financially would pay, pay the, the major share of it. If it was a generalized tax, then it'd be spread across all ages and young people who are not gonna need these services for a long time would end up paying for a long time. So we should have a debate about it, what's fair. We're already gonna be passing on a massive amount of debt to the next generation and you know, Right. Two, well, they're already going to have a big burden. they got to support us. <laughs> There's going to be a smaller... Well, that's the problem, and, and, and that's a, a, a smaller base compared to yeah. this growing bubble at the end. So there's fewer people paying taxes in one form or another to support an ever-growing um, and expensive cohort at the other end of the yeah, I think we have to be very careful about what we're passing through. It's an economic principle, but it's also a moral principle. We're passing on a lot of debt. They will have their own challenges, the aging. We're passing them on a huge environmental challenge. They will probably devote an unbelievable amount of their resources to adaptation and dealing with the climate change that they've had nothing to do with. So I, I think we've got to give them a free, a fairly free hand to allow them, and who knows? I mean, they will have their own crises. We have exactly. of economic fiscal crisis as kind of clockwork. We have one about every decade, and we had big recessions in the early 80s, the early 90s. We had a financial crisis. Now we've got uh, a virus. Um, I would hope not, but who knows? That kind of thing can strike together, and they they. Yeah, probably won't be the last. Relatively unencumbered to deal with that. Put this in the context on this report, and I know it's just uh, just been released, so we haven't heard a lot of response to it or reaction to it. Put this in the context of how we rebuild the economy. Uh, on Monday, of course, as we noted, there'll be an, uh, a fiscal statement from the finance minister. Um, they've laid out their priorities, which is a green-based recovery. Where does this kind of information fit as we start to rebuild? Well, right at the moment, I, and this is the reason why we did the report, I don't see anybody thinking it fits anywhere. Uh, a strange dichotomy going on, and it, it really perplexes me because there seems to be a difficulty in understanding. We have two things. We've got the midst of the virus itself and how that's going to play out and how you respond economically and fiscally and how one recovers from that. But we have the longer term as well. And they're getting mixed up. Um, there was an article in the Globe and Mail after uh, the finance minister's speech uh, recently that I loved because she spent a lot of time taking on what she thought was critics and said, no, we're not going to cut spending while we're still in the pandemic. And the journalist of the Globe and Mail said she effectively rebutted an argument nobody has made. And that's absolutely Thing is what we're talking about, we have the speech from the throne, which, if you believe it, it committed just to massive amounts of new mega projects that are going to be very expensive. And on the one hand, the government is saying, everything's so uncertain. We, we only gave you a snapshot on July 8th. We didn't even go beyond the current fiscal year. And this update on Monday probably won't go beyond 2021. It's saying that's too uncertain. But on the other hand, we're going to commit Canadians to a decade, a generation of big ticket spending items. And one of those you would think would be, what are we going to do about long-term care, whether it's federally or provincially or federal with assistance to the provinces, that doesn't seem to be on the radar screen. Um, well, the other is, thing that everybody's saying, and of course the last few days with the, uh, the hysteria around vaccines and the prime minister declaring that, you know, we're going to be kind of a, a bit down the line before we get these. We've talked about a lot of infrastructure spending, 
how the heck did we get to the point where we have very, very limited capacity to manufacture anything in this country? We get most of our pharmaceuticals from China, uh, the PPE, all of those things. And now we can't even reproduce the vaccine that may or may not be coming in a timely fashion. Uh, but that but that speaks to a bigger issue, and it's one I think that people are losing sight of, that we had enormous economic challenges for the country before COVID struck. And we will at some point have a, a manner of recovery from that, but we'll just be right back into those problems. So, and part of it is this aging phenomenon. If you look at our demographics and what that means for labor force, and if you look at our average rate of mediocre productivity growth over the last two decades, the sustainable long run economic growth rate of Canada is barely above one and a half percent. If we go back to the 1950s and 60s, it was triple, it was triple that rate and it slowed down. It's been a little over 2% for a while, slowing down to two and it's going to drop further. Uh, it's hard to fund all these kind of pressures when you've got the economy growing, but if, if, if you, when you peer below that kind of macro aggregate, you look at where's the growth come from? Well, we've had two powerhouses driving the Canadian economy historically, the manufacturing sector. It has half the percentage of the workers, the total workforce today than just 20 years ago, and the more basic manufacturing seems to be under threat. We're, we're just not competitive globally on that. And then, of course, uh, the natural resource industry, and particularly the oil and gas. And your head spins how quickly we shifted from talking about peak supply to peak demand. It was, it was we just can't get enough of this stuff. We can't get enough of this stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, we've got a current crisis with the prices depressed, but a lot of people are saying, Maybe there's not a market for this. Maybe the prices won't recover all that much going forward. Maybe they won't be the con contributor that we've had in the past. And if those two sectors don't fire the Canadian economy, then you ask yourself, what does? I think we've all been shaken from our nice, comfy, cozy view that being next to the giant of the economy in the world was was a great thing. That doesn't seem, you know, maybe... and and. Others have said it before me. Don't just think without Trump that everything is going to be different in America. No, exactly. I mean, we're going to be hassled at every single thing. That's not a free ride. And, of course, then we were going to do all these wonderful things from China, and that was looking pretty darn tough as well. So you look at it sectorally, you look at it demographically, you look at it geographically, and the pretty favorable economic performance we've had since the end of the Second World War looks like it might be a little bit strained. And but, but can we actually run an economy? I mean, if you look at the numbers, we, we as you've just cited, you we don't manufacture things, we don't make things. The energy sector is in some trouble because, of course, it's the basis of a lot of manufacturing. You need oil and gas and energy if you're going to build something else. The job creation is all service. The, the governor of the bank just saying yesterday that there's a stunning divide in wage earners because the kinds of jobs we're creating are not high enough wage as we go forward. I, I think it's a good thing to have manufacturing and goods production. We, we can be world beaters in other sectors. The financial service sector is a, an excellent example. It's a big share of the Canadian economy. A limited global reach, though, and you have to ask yourself about that. Most of the Canadian banks have a significant presence in the United States, but not a huge presence. A lot of the reaches beyond that have not been successful. But then if you look what support that, we, we have a, a legal and accounting profession uh, that supports the financial services sector. But why don't they do the books and the legal aspects for financial sex services across the world? It doesn't really matter if you're specialized in that. It's no particular magic of doing it for Canada. Why don't you draw a world industry into Canada? But, but we don't tend to do that. And if we're not going to make our fortunes off extracting uh, non-renewable resources, it'll still be important, but it's not going to be leading. Something else has to do it. But we have to be able to take on the world. And of course, even in that, the natural resources, of course, infamously in the beginning of the 2000s, virtually every major company in Canada sold out. We had an option to be one, two, or three player in the world and said we sold out the interests. And what leads us to that kind of position is, is very disturbing. 
I mean, the other issue, and it's kind of the flip side of, of a smaller group paying the bill and service sector level wages for, for far too many people, is that households and businesses in this country are sitting on a lot of cash and they are not investing. The business people that I talk to just say they, and this isn't COVID related particularly, although it's worse now, but they were saying this before, until there's some um, clearer plan here, and of course, some uh, the certainty in the US as well. They're not investing in this country. They're just not gonna put their money there. No, well, we see that across the spectrum. It's, it's interesting, you look, I mean, everything's IT and technology these days, and relative to the United States, we're fairly equally equipped on computer hardware, and we have about one quarter the extent per capita of computer software, and, and that's fascinating. And I I'm, had an interesting discussion with a former CEO of, uh, of IBM in, in Canada about this, and he said, when you peer beneath the aggregate level, numbers is even worse because when IBM will sell a piece of software in Canada, the United States, the use of it, it tends to be much more sophisticated in the United States. So the reality is different. They may use it for inventory control to be exaggerated. We've used it for word processing. May obviously we're doing better than that. But again, you have to wonder, you know, when we have this in Canada, we call this the valley of death. We create firms very quickly in Canada and they grow very quickly initially and then they tend to stall out. They sell or they stall out their growth plans after a few years and after they get about the half million dollar mark on, on earnings. Whereas in the United States, they tend to start off slower, but they continue to grow from that and they tend to find more markets. Um, may, you look, coming back to the China, yes. it's very interesting. The, the American Chamber of Commerce uh, tracks what the businesses are doing in China and increasingly they've shifted to production in China to sell to the Asian market. Most companies don't in Canada don't contemplate that. It's producing in Asia to sell back to the Western markets, but that's a bigger leap. It's more difficult. You have to be more associated with the, the culture and stuff. But it's a, it's a different mindset and, of course, a different taste for risk. Do we have to take on the China question? As you know, that debate is raging uh, and that we have to be less naive and stop thinking of China as some, you know, third world developing country. They're actually even America's largest competitor. If we decide that we need to bring some of that production and uh, work home, can we? Yeah, so I think we can. Uh, you know, we tend to just simply compare wage levels in the countries and mm -hmm. we don't look like we're remotely uh, competitive, but it, it's productivity adjusted wages that matter. And so if they're gonna have one fifth our wages, we have to have five times the productivity. And um, we're not that far off that kind of comparison, but of course their productivity as they trade around the rest of the world and incorporate uh, properly and improperly uh, technologies in the, in the rest of the world, of course they're closing that gap, but it is a constant need for us to keep that game advanced. And, uh, and I think we can do that. You know. We, we, we do have the skilled labor, and it's, it's interesting even relative to the United States when you talk to the sectors, the automobile sector and the forestry product sectors who operate in both Canada and the United States, and Mass, mm -hmm. they will speak to the quality, the superior quality of the Canadian workforce. And the automobile industry, for example, in numerous occasions has spoken to the advantage of our largely public healthcare system, where that is a huge business cost uh, in other jurisdictions. So it's not like we don't have some assets that we could exploit. So that's just a question of political will. Are we going to yeah. do it? Are we going to make that our build back better plan? Yeah, and we, we are blessed with a very strong education system in Canada. Our young people tend to do well, uh, K to 12 uh, could do better, but we tend to do quite well. And of course we have uh, very strong universities and colleges. And hopefully after the COVID settles down a little bit, uh, we will get back to have lots of international students because that's kind of a win-win. Uh, some other countries pay for the bulk of their education. We get the end of it. Half of them tend to stay and even if half go back, that's a, an excellent contact. I, I will never forget when um, Manulife made its venture into the Chinese market, uh, the CEO was very surprised to discover that a graduate of University of Western Ontario was the official who basically adjudicated whether they would get the license or not. 
And he says, there's absolutely no proof that that connection had any bearing on it, but you know, maybe it's not a bad plan. <laughs> I, I want to raise a question. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Marshall is uh, is on the line, and and here's her question because it bring, it's it's on the healthcare front. Um, I raised this question about where we're going to get the workers because none of our kids or grandkids want to work in long term care or in the health field. Uh, she says this. I worked in the Department of Health and Social Services in my home province. Home care was definitely a growth industry and very costly, but availability of home care workers was a big challenge. So where do we get them? How do we resource this industry? How do we increase supply? Well, I'll, here's where I'll come back to being the boring economist, demand and supply. <laughs> so the demand is there, and if the supply is not there, something's got to give. And of course, in a narrow way in economics, that would be the price, in this case would be a wage, but it's more than that. It, it's the price and the prestige. So we have never exactly. held personal care workers with any measure of prestige. It is kind of the bottom of the rung and you tend to do it when there are a lot of alternatives. Um, it is more, what's more important for us if, if we have elderly parents that who helps with their care. Um, Boomers look forward to it. I would like somebody and I would attach great importance if I need that support to it, but that, but that hasn't happened. So that will have to change. And so, this is part of the reason why I think the cost for the elderly will jump from 1.3 to 4.2. It will not just be more workers, it'll be better qualified, better trained, and better paid workers with better working conditions, safer working conditions. Um, you know, we, we've, we've all, we often look, coming back to the manufacturing, because it all kind of loops together, we think, why do so many younger people in places like Germany go into the trades? It's not just the money, because the money's pretty good. I mean, if anybody's checked with electricians and plumbers making Canada, it's not bad coin. <laughs> but they establish a prestige to it. Uh, you go there, exactly. certified plumber and electrician, and wow, and you, you kind of get that in Canada. And I, and I think that uh, prevents some people from going that route. And I think that is part of the problem. Also, I, f I find it's fascinating. You know, one of the very few recommendations from the advisory panel I chaired on labor market information uh, over, over 10 years ago was a, a help wanted index in Canada. And over the history of this that we've had, it, one of the tightest labor markets is in the healthcare sector. And yet one never hears about that. Uh, in fact, one almost always hears about the sectors that don't have particularly tight labor markets. And part is because it's so fragmented. There's not one voice that speaks to all of it. But as we change those conditions, I mean, we know we have reasonable compensation for doctors, the nurse practitioners can get a reasonably high salary, but a lot of the other workers don't, and that will have to change. But we also keep limits on even the numbers of doctors that we allow in to keep those wages high. We actually need more. Well, and, and particularly areas. So coming back to these seniors, uh, one of the scenarios I'm very worried about is we have 304 gerontologists uh, in Canada. Uh, we have a few minutes le left in our program. We could easily uh, name them. And <laughs> it's shocking to realize that uh, they're within a few years. Most of them are within a, a few years of retiring. And the inflow to the medical schools in Canada is but a trickle. A trickle will be exaggerating it. We have 470 rheumatologists in Canada, and there's almost no intake to that. So we are never going to change that organically. There's not enough people coming. Immigration will never address that. We're going to have to radicalize the whole approach. So if you're a family physician, you, in a sense, are going to become a gerontologist. 25% of the population will be seniors, but because they have higher needs, probably 50% of your client base is going to be on seniors and the small number of specialists will essentially become advisors. But that too, like why is that not really well known and why aren't there sophisticated plans to deal with that? That's not very hard to foresee. We, we count them chi high black hearts. They produce these kinds of numbers and we can see them going down and down simultaneously with a number of elderly seniors going up and up. It makes no sense. We, we used to have incentive programs in this country that would take young doctors being trained in this country, put them into rural communities where they're desperately, desperately needed and where we have a lot of concentration of seniors. 
uh, and perhaps pay off some of their debt or, or provide them with a house or whatever. Then it became clear that under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you couldn't request right. or require or demand that somebody go and live in a certain place. So we're kind of cutting off our nose to spite our face. Well, that, yeah, absolutely true. That you, you, you cannot put a, a fence around a smaller community and throw away the key and force them to stay there. So even if they go for a while, they tend to leave. I mean, it's a second best, perhaps, we'll see. Um, but some, there are some technological approaches to that. So I, I find it fascinating. And one of the very few positives that came out of COVID in the healthcare sector is we got five billing codes in Ontario for remote visits. Uh, right. It to drive me crazy. Uh, you need a blood result. And typically, if you're in a position to needing a blood result, you end up knowing more about that blood condition than the physician, but you couldn't get it yourself. I mean, the person in the world that can have your medical records is you yourself. It's not like, like you don't have a right to them. And you would have to physically go to a doctor's office to get one number. Uh, however, but the reason, of course, is they yeah. have a mean of getting compensated if they send it to you by email or, uh, or gave it to you by the phone. So we did address that. We can do remote yeah. visits. And, and in fact, uh, with artificial intelligence or robotics, we can probably end up doing quite a few procedures. And, and Maybe you don't want to be the, the experimental on that of your small in northern New Brunswick or wherever you might be or northern Saskatchewan, but that, that will yeah. ameliorate the problem to some degree. Yeah, I think it, it is. It's a start, provided we can keep it and provided that the, the system works. I want to, as our time is flying by here, I want to, um, if I can, go back to uh, a report that you released through the under the auspices of CD Howe in October. You call it Canada's foggy economic and fiscal future. I think that was being quite gentle. As we go through the numbers, you lay out, let me just give me a second, I'm going to do it because there's no Goldilocks solution here, as far as I can tell. We're either going to be, regardless of what we do, $25 billion in uh, in debt, fifty billion dollars in debt, or a hundred billion dollars in debt. So there's nothing in that uh, solution that is just right. Um, these are staggering numbers. Well, you know, given the reaction of that report, I have to hasten with a word of what the report is not, because people seem to have difficulty. This is not a criticism of the government's response in the wake of COVID. This is not uh, exactly. yeah. that they pull back on that. Because everybody says, well, no, you're wrong. We're not going to do that. I never said that. I'm talking <laughs> post the recovery from health and reasonably right. from health. Where are we going to go? And what rocked me was the number of speeches the prime minister gave this summer. Where he's constantly talking about these huge ticket items. I mean, the list is very yeah. long. But, uh, of course, basic income, national farmer care, national child care, national training structure, the infrastructure, remove the greening of the economy, and those are just a few of them. I mean, these are a minimum of $20 billion a year. They could be 50 plus billion dollars a year. Uh, where's that money going to come from? And, and of course, the suggestion, well, we won't raise any taxes. And that's why I think that, that doesn't add up. And mm -hmm. I, I find it very disturbing that there's no debate in Canada about that kind of future. Shouldn't the 39 million Canadians be engaged in that and have some kind of say about where they want to go, young and old? And the young better pay attention. I mean, I, I yeah. think about, you know, having been part of the so-called solution to the Canada Pension Plan in the 1990s, I still wear the concern that at that time, the benefit of the Canada Pension Plan to a young person was 5.5% of their salary, and for their entire life, they're going to pay with their employer 9.9%. .9. They cross. <laughs> it's not a good they, investment. <laughs> uh, we're going to pay attention to that kind of stuff. And of course, yeah. it came in the wake of the failed attempt to income test the old age security, and the politicians learned the lesson hey, these seniors can mount a pretty powerful voice. When you go back to your writing, you encounter an awful lot of seniors, not so many uh, younger people, but they should have a voice. Uh, and, you know, that comes back to if, if we just lock in the current 50% debt to GDP ratio, that means effectively we have taken all the debt associated with the response to COVID, we put it in a box, put a ribbon around it, and we're going to hand it to the next generation. And I yeah. need to ask ourselves as older people, does that, is that fair? And young people need to say, well, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> I'm 
crises to deal with, not necessarily yours, but we should have a, a, a debate in the country about that direction. But we also, I find it flabbergasting that these big ticket initiatives have been kicking around for a long time. We've had no debate. I'm going to take Pharmacare. So depending on your survey, between typically between 5 and 13% of Canadians have a financial difficulty taking a prescription. That's a significant number. It's not everybody. Most of us, like myself, retired. I've got a private plan, um, mm -hmm. here, but it's okay. Um, most of us are in that situation. We got gaps, and it's the same thing on basic income. The gaps are the working age adults without children. Um, we kind of have a basic income for families, low income families with children called the Canada Child Tax Benefit, augmented by a province. We have a perfectly designed OAS and GIS, and the farmer care between the provincial plans, like in Quebec. So if you don't have a private plan, it's mandatory of a public plan. So they don't tend to have that sort of issue. There are alternatives. We should have a debate. I'm not saying which way, but there's kind of a big yeah. bang on pharmacare. There's a big bang on basic income, but there's also alternative fill in the cracks that are less expensive. But I don't see that debate and I don't see the argument. And part of it is the government's not even putting out the information to foster that kind of debate. Okay, so this is really important because, I mean, it does happen in small places like this where you're actually saying we've got to put some price tags on this. We've got really to look seriously at the need as you talk about with, you know, health care or, or some kind of basic income supplement. And, and I don't find a forum for this because if you look at the House of Commons and you and I've been doing that for a very, very long time, it's not the place for really sharp, intelligent debate. Well, you know, it's not that long ago that governments did play a role in this and, and to show that I am not partisan, I will go back to the agenda for economic re renewal from Brian Moroni and Michael Wilson. Yeah. It laid out a vision for how they thought the economic and fiscal future should unfold. Maybe people disagreed with it, but it was a platform that launched a debate. And before the Martin Kretchen government struck with the infamous 1995 budget, they put out the so-called purple and gray books that laid out respectively their vision of how the economy and the fiscal would do. And again, there was critics of them and that was fine, but it opened the gate, it had information, it had a basis upon which a debate could unfold. We haven't seen the likes of that for an awful long time. Okay, I'm going to ask you, I hope um, isn't a particularly awkward question, but you did work in the Department of Finance for 23 years, and I do, you're absolutely right, that governments would put out plans, sometimes quite detailed. I remember covering, uh, you know, budget lockups and your eyes would be crossed uh, six or eight hours later trying to read all through this damn stuff and make sense of it. But do we have the kind of people inside government to create the documents uh, and the, the pressure, I guess, on the, the public political figures to get this debate out there, to make it transparent, to put the figures attached to it, whether it's pretty or not, uh, and get it out there? I mean, I'm, I'm really troubled when I see civil servants in the province of Alberta leaking tapes of conversations uh, with people. That's not a nonpartisan civil service focused on what needs to get done. That's somebody playing politics. Well, absolutely. There's a capacity to do that. Is there the political will to do that? I mean, there's an unfortunate model that was somewhat successful uh, in 2011, the then conservative government swung wildly from fiscal expansion to fiscal austerity and never really revealed to Canadians, including to Parliament, exactly how that was done. And kind of got away with it, really. I mean, ultimately, they did lose an election, but I don't think they lost it over that. And if you look at that, there was kind of a mere response to that in Ontario because in the later stages of Dalton McGuinty's government, they were quite explicit and open about what they were going to do. And I think Kathleen Wynne just made the calculation, hey, well, look what uh, Stephen Harper's doing. Let's just do it and not really tell anybody how we're doing it. And, you know, <laughs> and I also relate back to Ontario and the, sort of the Tim Hudak rule. He thought it was a positive political thing to almost brag that he was going to, if elected, lay off 68,000 civil servants. I think that cost him. But the reality yeah. is, 
And that election, it didn't matter whether it was going to be conservative, liberal, or NDP. The civil service was going to go down 68,000. And it seemed to kind of there was some political benefit to not telling people about it. Just do it and not tell everybody about it. It's, it's a kind of a different era, and it comes back to the broader communications challenges. I mean, that big thrust in the 1995 budget, we are extremely explicit how we're doing it. I mean, you know, you, you were at the heart of that scene. We used to call it the trickle-down news. If you yep. the document and it got picked up, you mean 80%, okay, in adults watch one of the three nightly news programs. Now it's 20%. And yeah. we got an editorial in the Globe and Mail that would be picked up by virtually every newspaper, including all the community newspapers that no longer exist. Yeah, exactly. And it right. wasn't all that hard. You can't communicate in that way anymore. Yeah. And you've got people who seek, the, if you're wanting right-wing news, you seek only right-wing news, and you can't bridge people anymore. So I am sympathetic to that, and I guess part of the result of that is, well, let's just keep it to ourselves. I mean, I have... I'm guessing, I don't know, I have no inside information. I am 99.9% .9 certain the kind of longer term economic fiscal scenarios I would like to see are in the hands of finance and they're being shared with the Privy Council office and the Prime Minister's office. I would be scandalized if that weren't the case. They can do it, I'm sure that they're doing it, but it's remaining in an eternal debate. So is anybody reading it? And does anybody want to talk about it? Yeah, so but fortunately we do have the parliamentary budget office and you made a yeah. To, to that and they do on occasion uh, they probably do fairly soon to come out with a longer term uh, plan as uh, a facsimile to what I would prefer it came from the government but uh, it's better than nothing. How worried are you about the liabilities on the Bank of Canada right now uh, funding this um, massive spending that's going on and obviously thinking about the massive projects that are being talked about, as you say, uh, and, and picking up provincial debt. I think it's they last week broke through the $300 billion uh, mark, the glue, what should have been, well, should have been a ceiling, but it's pretty glass and it shattered pretty quickly. Can we keep doing this? Uh, I'm not so worried about those, but I'm concerned much more broadly about monetary policy, and it's all the central banks literally around the world. Monetary policy is designed to get in hard, get in fast, and get out hard and fast. If you're building an inflation problem, you knock them between the eyes very quickly and you go back to a neutral stance. If the economy is weak, you lower, you provide the stimulus very quickly and then get back out. It is a policy where I would say 95% of the time, quite frankly, the people at the Bank of Canada shouldn't even show up for work. The just You're just trying to keep it on an even keel, keep the rudder in the middle and just, you know, you've got a kind of a natural potential growth rate and try to keep on that track and where it veers, get in, get out fast. But we have had hyper stimulative policy now for 13 years and it's building up in balances and it is becoming a root of instability. Uh, we are awash in the world, including in Canada, in debt. We have it at the household sector, the public sector, and at the corporate sector. And there's one reason for that, because it's super cheap. So if you want a well-growing economy over a longer period of time, you have to have incentives to save and invest. And we don't have that. And again, coming back to our generation, you're talking to somebody whose first mortgage was 17%. If you've got your hands on one Penny, right. You paid down the principal. Try that on a younger person, and they'll look at you. What the heck are you talking about? I got a mm -hmm. two point four five percent. Why would I pay it back? And you got, yeah, I I get that, but it's not always that way. And in fact, it's not just we're guessing when interest rates should go up. We should actually want interest rates to go up, not high, but more to a neutral kind of level because it's creating all kinds of problems having them this low for that long. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you yeah. can put some money in an RSP right now, you're, you're lucky if you're getting 0.6%. You're not even remotely covering the cost of inflation. So the incentive is don't save it, just spend it. And just spend it. Unaffordable housing around the world, and particularly in some of the centers in Canada. That's a cause and effect. So I, I, I think we have to look for opportunities for monetary policy in Canada and elsewhere to get back to a more neutral st standing and then hopefully stay there once they can do that. Not at the moment again, it's the same thing. Right, not at uh, I, I, I the I guess, in our hand. We've got to keep the juice flowing for a while. That.
In your document, though, you talk about uh, the need for a fiscal anchor, that uh, somebody somewhere has to pick a point about debt to GTB ratio or something uh, so that we just don't have this spiraling. And it, it comes with another one of the, the questions uh, that is being raised here. We can't see the whole world, the, the whole part of the question, but kind of your take on modern monetary theory, and whether or not anybody in the world can afford that. Well, modern monetary theory, I think, is not so much an economic phenomenon as a human phenomenon because we tend to believe when something is different than we've experienced in the past, it's a permanent change. And from our life experience, about 99% of the time, that's not the case. We revert back to the normal. And, of course, we change our behavior in the meantime, and then we knock between the eyes. So monetary theory basically says you can just keep the crank going as long as you want, um, cover debt spending with inflation, with increases in the money supply, it won't cause inflation. Maybe, but if it does, you're going to be way down at the end of that road <laughs> with, with nowhere to go. Yeah. And then you're going to pay a big price as we did before. And the dirty little secret of the modern monetary theory that proponents don't tend to tell you is they do not deny that it might lead to inflation problem, but their solution is increases in taxes to deal with it rather than raising interest rates. Nobody tells you that. And interestingly enough, many of the proponents of the modern monetary theory are also proponents for keeping taxation low. And you say, no, I right. think you didn't read to the end of the theory. You're, you're only really selling part of it. My belief is that, yeah, inflation seems to be dead at the moment, but if you keep cranking it up forever, it'll be a problem. Like, but I, we're not there right now. I mean, the economy is obviously, uh, if not flat out, it's down on its knees still. We don't have that problem at the moment, but we, we have to be mindful about it, and we will have to gradually pull back this fiscal and monetary stimulus so we don't get into that kind of problem. What kind of taxes, because I agree completely, this is inevitable, You're, we're going to have to pay the bill somehow and, and inflation will creep a little bit, uh, even if not huge numbers, that seems to be the panacea right now, don't worry, interest rates are low, we can borrow till we're, you know, uh, blue in the face. But, but what about the kinds of tax hikes? What are we going to do? I mean, we're, we've got carbon taxes, people are now talking about taxing work at home because... People are, are increasingly, I think, in the new world going to want to continue to do that to some degree. Where are we going to generate this money, this tax dollar? I think we only have two taxes that are available to use right now from an economic perspective, and that's the GST slash HST for the provinces that are in line with it and the carbon tax. Um, we have, you know, I'm sorry to get technical, but I, I a marginal personal income tax. So what you pay in personal income tax on the last dollar earned. Uh, for most Canadians, that's over half of your money. You're getting less than half if you earn back. And, and it's highest for modest income families with children because of the clawbacks for various benefits like the child tax. Right. And if you're facing a tax back of 60 to 70%, there's just no incentive to work, save, and, and invest. And um, you, you get all kinds of perverse... Uh, Responses from that, our corporate income taxes are really constrained by what's going around the rest of the world. We were in a pretty sweet spot because the United States probably had the worst corporate income tax regime in the world. They did right. not reform it, unlike what Michael Wilson did in the 1980s. They took the easy route and they just cut the marginal rate and left all the, the silly preferences in place. But it did prevent present a competitive barrier. I don't think that we can go with higher corporate income taxes. All the rest of the stuff is nickel and dimes. Yeah, I mean, you used to have a jewelry tax and all that kind of stuff. You can get some money out of the user fees, but the big money would be in the GST, the HST, and you can offset the income effect with low-income credits or the carbon tax. Now, the carbon tax seems to be out of play right at the moment. We've got to get the Supreme Court decision of the constitutionality of levying on the provinces, but also you have a lot of political baggage with it. I mean, the reality is we're a bit stuck because we build it from going from 30 to 50, but quite frankly, to do the environmental trick, it's got to go away from 100. I don't think Canadians will embrace that. And we would have to change the pitch because the pitch right now is all the money from it will go back to households by way of rebates. And of course, you would have to change it that a lot of it would go back to pay for family care or child care or national training strategy or to pay down the debt. I, I think that could be done, but uh, the tax route is never an easy one, and we got pretty limited tools available. 
We could get a fair bit of money. I mean, you know that uh, annual document, the tax expenditure report from the Department of Finance. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Almost none of them would pass any reasonable benefit costs. One could get about them, but that's the classic thing in politics. Uh, you don't take anything away. Benefit won't say anything. The people that are affected and lose will scream really loudly, so they don't tend to get looked at very carefully. So what's the immediate thing? What would you like to hear uh, Monday from Christian Friedland that would give you some peace of mind? I don't think I'm going to hear anything that will satisfy <laughs> I, mean, I think I could write it right now. Uh, we'll get an extension of the July snapshot instead of just this. this right. We'll hear that instead of $343 billion, the deficit will be $380 billion. We'll probably open a window to 2021, and I suspect the deficit will be in the 120 to 150 billion, not as high under their assumptions. We will probably see an expectation of some kind of recovery, but again, deferred given the, you know, we keep talking about the second wave, but I think that implies the first one finished. It never really did. I think we got off exactly you know, yeah. something that's continuing. So I think they'll again assume a recovery, but pushed off. And I think they'll say virtually nothing beyond 2021. So we still got this incongruence of a very short term perspective that they're letting Canadians on, but we still got these massive uh, speech from the throne initiatives coming. And you know, there's a final word on that, a fascinating federal provincial dimension because there is no element of provincial jurisdiction in the speech from the throne doesn't say the federal government is going to go into. In fact, my favorite sentence is the federal government is going to share access for every Canadian to family physician. And you can <laughs> a copy of the Constitution, and you will not find that in that. Right. Meanwhile, and talk about fiscal pressures, the government keeps their thumb on the Canada health transfer with the decline in nominal GDP. That thing's going to slug along at 3% of growth for a couple of years where the health care bills rise faster than that. And it's put on caps on all the other programs, equalization and the stabilization program. So it's like, we got money, we're going to intervene in provincial jurisdiction, but on the cost sharing, yeah, we're going to keep the tight limits on that. So there's lots of pressures that have not really been exposed uh, as well. The other issue that I think is just one of those day-to-day -day things, you walk down the street in small town Canada or in big city Canada, it doesn't matter, and you see shuttered businesses. Uh, yeah. Round one, which of course, as you say, never really ended before we got into round two of the COVID. The round one, they were taking it, uh, and they're going to shut down temporarily. Round two means they're done. Um, and if we lose that small business sector, and I mean small, it might be three or four people running a business or a husband and wife. If we lose that basic um, economic activity, but it's also very important socially in our country that people have those alternatives. We, we can't spend our whole life on Amazon. So, so I, I, mean, I quite often go back to a perspective I uh, put out in February of how this whole thing would unfold. And I was at that time much more pessimistic than the consensus. And with two exceptions, I'll come back to that. I was uncannily accurate. Um, the economic decline I predicted would be very deep, and of course it was. And I predicted this thing is going to be much, much more prolonged than people thought, because all the previous viruses like that did have waves that came back. And I thought that would happen, and I thought the vaccine would come later. And we thought it would take a long time to get the distribution. And, and it may not be as effective as we're even assuming right now. So we have all those additional problems. The, the two areas where I missed the boat, I thought it would damage the housing sector much more than it has. Uh, housing prices in particular have been very strong, but we've, we've seen a yeah. lot of activity in the housing sector. It hasn't dampened that. And I thought we were gonna see a massive wave of bankruptcies, house, uh, corporation and household. And we haven't seen that so far, but I think maybe my timing is off that. Um, and, and I think the government's support came more forcefully and faster, particularly in the household sector side than I'd anticipated. And I think that deferred it. It didn't necessarily end it. There are some hope. I mean, I was greatly concerned about what would happen when these four to six months deferrals on mortgage payments would be getting back right. on the track. And we're seeing the majority of people who are coming, are coming back on making the payments and that's going better. But again, that speaks 
to the extraordinary assistance the government has provided on the household sector, but I am very, very concerned of exactly what you refer to, and particularly for the smaller businesses. And I think that we are going to see a rash of them going under. We'll see some consolidations, life will go on some fashion, but there's going to be a lot, a lot of disruption. You know, one of the final things I meant, I, there was a study that came out in the heat of the, of the, of the virus from the University of Chicago, and it said that 40% of what seems to be temporary job losses will be permanent, and everybody was shocked. Mm -hmm. The reality is, in Canada, when we have an economic cycle, more than 30% of the jobs that are lost during a recession never come back. So their 40% number was not out of the ordinary, and if anything, it's going to be higher, and it just shows you that you have to be careful in dealing with the aggregate numbers. The aggregate employment seems to be recovering, but there's a phenomenal amount of churn and dislocation for people beneath that. And a lot of the jobs that are in won't come back or they won't come to conform. And will they be in a position to fill in new jobs? Often they're in different locations, they're a different set of Exactly. And, uh, yeah. We had never, in other countries, we don't have successful models to retrain adults particularly if they've tended with not advanced education and have tended to work in one particular industry for a long time. It's very hard, 45, 50, 55, uh, to shift something yeah. that's quite different. We make efforts, but to become, it doesn't tend to work very well. Become a big worker. Don Drummond, thank you so much. Uh, uh, very interesting report on aging well. That'll be available any minute now. Maybe it is. It is available now. Uh, we'll, yep. Yeah, available now, and your work through CD Howe. We appreciate your insights today. It really is helpful, and I, I, I've got to say a, a thousand percent you're right on. We've got to start having these debates, and thank you for kicking it off today. Really okay. appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Bye. Great. So much. Okay. So I will see if Greg or Steve, if anyone has a final word today. Greg? No, just a, a big thank you to you both for pulling this off. This is great insight. And, 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 and like you've said, Senator, all we want to do is try and advance the debate and try and put a voice to the, the data, and, and we've succeeded here today. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, everybody who participated. We'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye now.